BBC World News is brought to you by WLIW New York. Funding for this presentation has been provided by the Freeman Foundation of New York, Stowe, Vermont, and Honolulu, the Newman's Own Foundation, and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. This is BBC World. I'm Katty Kay in Washington. The United States warns of a new threat from Al-Qaeda in the war-torn state of Somalia. The U.S. death toll reaches 2,500, but the military hails progress against the Iraqi insurgents. In London, I'm Mike Ambley. Sri Lanka, its worst violence for years. 64 people are killed in a bomb attack on a bus. And she quoted Marx, and she made World Cup jokes how the Queen celebrated her 80th birthday. The United States is warning of a new threat from Al-Qaeda, this time in the war-torn state of Somalia. In the past few days, an Islamic militant army has routed a loose alliance of warlords backed by America and seized control of the capital. Meanwhile, the U.S. has convened a meeting in New York to discuss a new strategy for Somalia. Our security correspondent Frank Gardner has this report. The taking of Jalhar town. This is the Islamic militia routing the unpopular US-funded warlords. Victorious, they be quick to impose a curfew and Islamic law. We want to secure law and order, says their leader. Then no one can take a gun inside Jauhar town except security people. And from today, from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m., there is a curfew in town. Locals say they welcome the newfound security. In Somalia, Washington appears to have backed the losing side, and now it's worried. We do have concerns about al-Qaeda presence in Somalia, um, and specifically individuals, uh, and their presence in Somalia. Uh, nobody, wants, nobody wants Somalia to become a, a safe haven. Well, maybe there, maybe there are some, um, those, those terrorists. To keep al-Qaeda out, the U.S. has set up base in neighboring Djibouti. With nearly 2,000 troops, naval and air patrols, it's trying to keep tabs on the region. But with Somalia, it's had to adopt a more subtle approach. From the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi, the CIA has reportedly been secretly funding Somali warlords with cash. Critics say the policy has backfired. They instead just picked a few warlords uh, to pursue a very narrow military strategy of capturing al-Qaeda suspects and ignoring the context uh, that they were uh, swimming in. And uh, the result is that we now have no access whatsoever to Mogadishu and the uh, situation is gravely uh, deteriorated. The, the last time U.S. troops went into Somalia, it ended in disaster. In the so-called Black Hawk Down incident, Somali gunmen shot down two U.S. helicopters and killed 18 rangers. They haven't been back since. Today, America is not loved in Somalia, but nor is Al-Qaeda. The West will have to deal constructively with the new situation or risk driving moderate Islamists into the arms of extremists. Frank Gardner reporting there. Well, joining me in the studio is Ambassador David Shin. He was the State Department's coordinator for Somalia at the time of the UN intervention in 1993. Thanks very much for joining us, Ambassador. To what extent is this conference in New York a recognition that U.S. policy in Somalia has effectively failed? I think it very much is a recognition of that. Uh, it's a very good step to have this conference. Unfortunately, it's several years too late. What support has the U.S. been giving to the warlords over the last few years? I don't know definitively what has been given to the warlords, but the mere fact that there was no definitive denial of the charges that there was support going to the warlords suggests to me that where there's smoke, there's fire. And the Kofi Annan's comments that the U.N. would not have recommended supporting the warlords, that he would have not recommended supporting the warlords, suggests that there's a difference of opinion there, too. I think there are very few uh, experts in the field who would have uh, recommended supporting warlords. Uh, they're simply not reliable. They're out for their own interests, not for the interests of the United States. OK, now that we have this conference and there is a recognition that the past policy has failed, what has to happen now for 
stability in Somalia. We've got the warlord saying that it won't accept a foreign peace course, f keeping force, uh, an AU force in any, in any shape or form, and the transitional government saying that's what they want. I mean, even a peacekeeping force they can't agree on. I think a peacekeeping force uh, is not likely over the short term. Uh, one, who would do it? Who would be acceptable? There's been talk of Sudanese and Ugandan troops who might be acceptable to most uh, Somalis, but uh, is that going to be enough? Can they really have an effective force? Uh, I doubt it. Uh, so there's just the logistical problem of who would do it. In addition to that, uh, I suspect that most Somalis would rather not have any foreign peacekeeping force in the country. And I'm not at all convinced it's the right move at this time. I think the, uh, the goal ought to be to try to have successful talks between the transitional federal government, the Abdullah Yusuf government, and the Sharia courts who control most, but not all, of Mogadishu and some of the surrounding country, uh, and try to work out some kind of an arrangement for a broader-based uh, administration in Mogadishu. There has been no governing uh, group in Mogadishu uh, for the last uh, 12 years. And do you see a format in which those talks could take place? The talks were actually underway between the transitional federal government and the courts and they broke down over this issue of a foreign peacekeeping force so basically the the transitional federal government would have to back away from that uh, that desire ambassador thank you very much for coming in you're welcome the beginning of the end of al-Qaeda in Iraq. Those are the words of the Iraqi government as the United States military released figures claiming progress against the insurgency. The U.S. says that 452 raids have been carried out in the week since the death of Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, killing more than 100 insurgents. But another statistic made grim reading for the Americans. The number of U.S. soldiers killed in Iraq has reached 2,500. From Baghdad, Andrew North reports and you may find the pictures at the start of this report disturbing in Iraq the grief never ends this was north of Baghdad this morning ten men on their way to work but gunmen stopped their vehicle and shot them dead it was a sectarian attack <laughs> I am their father, he says. Why is this happening to us? Is this Islam? The Americans blame Al-Qaeda for stirring up this violence. And today, they identified the man they believe has taken over as its leader in Iraq. What we do know about Ayub al-Masri is that he is a senior Al-Qaeda and Iraq operative and direct associate of Zarqawi. We know he is responsible for facilitating the movement of foreign fighters from Syria Abu Ayyub al-Masri was already on a U.S. wanted list. They say he's been a terrorist since 1982. Born in Egypt, Masri is a bomb-making expert and trained at al-Qaeda camps in Afghanistan in the late 90s. But both the Americans and the Iraqi government say al-Qaeda has been hit hard in the past week. We believe that this is the beginning of the end of al-Qaeda in Iraq. We believe Al-Qaeda in Iraq was taken by surprise. They did not anticipate how powerful the Iraqi security forces are. Those security forces were out in strength around Baghdad today, checking vehicles around the city. It was day two of a crackdown ordered by the government. The Americans and the Iraqi authorities believe they've dealt Al-Qaeda a serious blow after the killing of its leader a week ago but they're not taking any chances. There are still thousands of extra troops deployed around the city, trying to prevent the group carrying out new attacks. And the violence is still claiming American casualties. On average, two US soldiers are killed each day, but many more Iraqis. Three years on from the invasion, they're still paying the heaviest price. Andrew North, BBC News, Baghdad. The former Liberian leader Charles Taylor could be headed to prison in Britain if he's convicted of war crimes. I'll be back with more on that story later on in the programme. First, though, let's go to Mike in London. Mike, there's been terrible violence in Sri Lanka. Does this really mean that the truce is effectively over? Well, that ceasefire is increasingly looking like a piece of paper, Catty. See you, yes, in just a moment. There are fears that Sri Lanka is sliding once more towards civil war. At least 60 people were killed in the past 24 hours, dozens injured when a bus was blown up by 
by landmines. The Sri Lankan government is blaming the attack in Anura Dapuron on Tamil Tiger rebels who deny any involvement. The group has been fighting for a separate homeland for 30 years. A ceasefire was signed four years ago. Andrew Harding reports from Colombo. Will this be enough to push Sri Lanka over the brink? An overcrowded bus ripped apart this morning on a country road. Schoolchildren among the many dozens killed and injured when two explosions sent shrapnel slicing through the bus. A savage attack in a country already on a knife edge. The Tamil Tiger rebels insist this is not their handiwork, but Sri Lanka's government is in no doubt. These terrorists were well aware that this was innocent civilians. And they chose the barbaric, the brutal nature of terrorism. Whatever the truth, this fits an ominous pattern. Months of escalating violence between the army and the Tiger rebels. The ceasefire deal they signed four years ago is now in grave danger. More recent talks have failed. International mediators blaming both sides. Pressure on the Tigers intense. Now the European Union has labeled them a terrorist organization. Already thousands of civilians are preparing for the worst. These Tamil families trying to flee to India. We're caught between the army and the tigers, says this man, afraid his four sons could be pulled into the conflict. Tonight, Sri Lanka is stumbling towards another full-scale war. There's still time to stop it, but not much time. The government has already begun air bombardments against Tamil Tiger positions. It will take huge restraint from both sides to keep this conflict under control. Andrew Harding, BBC News, Colombo. European Union leaders have agreed in principle on a deadline of 2008 to decide what to do about the stalled EU constitution. The French and Dutch rejected the constitution a year ago and it was decided to shelve the problem for a period of reflection. 25 heads of government have just broken up talks at an EU summit in Brussels. Well, the BBC's Europe editor, Mark Mardell, is there. He told me many will say a decision on the Constitution is just being put off again. It just happens that some governments say that the Constitution is dead, there's nothing you can do about it, it's dead. Others say, well, it can be revived eventually, it's still alive. Now, they can't reach an agreement over that. But it's, it's a bit deeper than just putting off a decision because what they do agree about is that there's something worth saving in the Constitution. It may be different bits, but they all think there's something worth saving. So what they're saying is to the Germans who take over the EU presidency at the beginning of next year, come back around this time next year with a roadmap, a way forward, and then by 2008 we'll have something, whether it's the old Constitution, a new Constitution, a treaty, we'll have something that we can start to start talking about whether there have to be more referendums and, and uh, our governments backing it again. Our Europe editor Mark Mardell there and still to come here on BBC World. A photo and drugs allegations, but police say lack of evidence means they can't prosecute Kate Moss. With its constitution on hold, where is Europe heading? Join me, Emma Jane Kirby, in Brussels as EU leaders try to plot a new course for Europe's future. I'm investigating are very serious that some of the men who run the beautiful game here at FIFA headquarters have been pocketing bribes shares into free fall on Tuesday they lost 26% of its value Walmart could significantly increase wages and benefits for its workers and still earn a decent profit without raising prices that's the conclusion of a recent study done by the Economic Policy Institute facing intense criticism Walmart has recently taken steps to improve the quality of its health care benefits. The firm has always argued that its low prices save consumers money, which they then spend elsewhere. The head of America's central bank warned on the effects of high oil prices again on Thursday. Ben Bernanke was speaking about energy and said the higher costs could account for the pickup of inflation figures revealed this week. Unlike earlier episodes, the significantly higher relative price of energy that we are now experiencing 
is expected to be relatively long-lasting and thus will likely prompt more significant adjustments by households and businesses over time. So taking a look at what happened on the markets, they were clearly relieved by some of the things that Ben Bernanke had to say, mostly on the subject of productivity and the fact that it's very strong in America. But they staged a second day of gains, taking the Dow through the 11,000 level. It was up 198 points. The Nasdaq was up and European markets were also much stronger. You're watching BBC World. A quick look at our main headlines again. A crisis summit on Somalia is held in New York as Islamists expand their grip on the country. And the U.S. death toll reaches 2,500, but the military hails progress against the Iraqi insurgents. If the former Liberian president, Charles Taylor, is convicted of war crimes, the British government has announced that he will serve his sentence in Britain. Mr. Taylor is held at present in Sierra Leone, but the UN-backed special court in Freetown fears that his presence there will destabilize the country. Instead, they want him tried at The Hague, and it looks likely that the trial will now go ahead. The supermodel Kate Moss will not face charges over allegations that she took illegal drugs at a recording studio in London last year. The Crown Prosecution Service says despite a video footage giving an absolutely clear indication that Kate Moss was using controlled drugs and providing them to others, there's just not enough forensic or eyewitness evidence to convict her. This is the image which started it all. Kate Moss appears to be preparing lines of cocaine, then snorting them. CPS lawyers say this provides an absolutely clear indication she was using controlled drugs and providing them to others. Later, Kate Moss checked into rehab in America and apologized for what she called letting people down. And yet she will not be prosecuted. I think it's very important that people who do do criminal activity as a result of their drug addiction are prosecuted because they are human beings who need to take responsibility for their actions. I'm concerned about what message is, is going to be coming out because of this because um, it isn't rarely a legal issue, it's much more of a social issue. So why wasn't Kate Moss prosecuted? The CPS says there were delays in the police investigation. They had to get a court order to search for crucial evidence, and Kate Moss left the country for several months. They never found the actual substance in the photograph. And when she did return, she and eyewitnesses refused to explain the picture. I think the people around Kate Moss were under an enormous amount of pressure to keep quiet regarding the allegations of her snorting cocaine, which of course came out in the mirror. And I think they would have been told not to say anything. You know, their jobs would have been under, you know, that their heads would have rolled if they did. The CPS says expert analysis of the substance in the photos suggests it's cocaine or ecstasy, class A drugs, or amphetamine, which is categorized class B. Possession or supplying any of the three is unlawful. But, says the CPS, the prosecution must prove beyond reasonable doubt the legal category to which the substance belonged. Proving it belonged to one or other of two different legal categories is not sufficient. Without that or other evidence, prosecution was impossible. The reality was there simply was no evidence. There was no one who could confirm that the powder that appeared in the photograph was actually cocaine. End of case. This shouldn't even have gone to the police. When the photos first appeared, Kate Moss lost some of her most lucrative contracts, but she's gained others since, and some believe is making more money than ever. Margaret Gilmore reporting there. The founder and chairman of Microsoft, Bill Gates, has announced that he'll relinquish day-to-day -day control of the company in two years' time. Mr. Gates, one of the world's richest men, plans to put more work into his charitable foundation. He will continue as chairman of Microsoft and he'll advise on key projects. Thousands of teachers in Mexico have taken to the streets again to continue their demands for higher wages. More than a million students have been affected by a strike called by the main teachers union and over 14,000 schools remain closed. It comes a day after they fought running battles with the police. The teachers are now demanding the resignation of a regional governor ahead of presidential elections. And still to come here on BBC World, stay with us, a special service of Thanksgiving in London to mark Queen Elizabeth's 80th birthday.
The allegations I'm investigating are very serious. That some of the men who run the beautiful game here at FIFA headquarters have been pocketing bribes worth millions of pounds. She's a man, Nelly Furtado. Niles Barkley. James Blunt. This is what every artist at Record Company wants, a money-making hit. All very different songs, but according to the makers of Music Intelligence, break them down mathematically, they're all the same. If you look at the music that has been invented all the way back from the time of Beethoven through the 20th century with punk, grunge, disco, rock and roll, all of the hit songs from these genres have conformed to the same number or the same mathematical patterns as new music today. Take me away from the Amanda Ghost certainly knows a thing or two about writing hits. She's just won two Ivor Novello Awards for co-writing You're Beautiful with James Blunt. Now she's agreed to test out her new song with this machine. According to the computer, Deep Water should be very successful. In fact, it's in the same cluster as her biggest hit. It's interesting that I'm compared to James Blunt, you're beautiful, because I don't think they sound similar at all. I think it would be a very sad day if, if music was only getting signed based on this science, because I don't think it's moving it forward in any way. It's not just the writers who are sceptical. One of the most successful managers in the business has his doubts too. It's probably a lazy way out for record companies, because they can't get hit records, you know? They should just talk to people more, and people will tell you what they like. Sony BMG is one of a number of big record companies using this program. They say it's just a guide. The final decision always comes down to a human. Richard Westcott, BBC News. Here in Britain, the Queen quoted Groucho Marx and joked about the World Cup at a special lunch to celebrate her 80th birthday. Prime Ministers past and present, church leaders and other celebrities joined thousands of people for a service of thanksgiving at St Paul's Cathedral. The BBC's Nicholas Witchell reports. After the essentially family celebrations of two months ago, this was the state occasion when the nation gave thanks for the Queen's 80 years. Within St Paul's Cathedral was Britain's establishment, its political and religious leaders, senior judges, civil servants and soldiers, and a hundred members of the public who gained their places in a ballot. In his sermon, the Archbishop of Canterbury spoke of the unifying role of monarchy and of the dedication of this monarch. Today, Your Majesty, we give thanks with you simply for the gifts of life and experience. But we also give thanks for a human face to our systems and processes, a human symbol that helps hold us together. Among those leading the state prayers for the royal family was a Muslim, the High Commissioner for the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. For Her Majesty the Queen, in thanksgiving for her long dedication to public service, and the building up of our common life. Gracious God. She led the royal family out of St. Paul's and then, in the sunshine, she went on a short walkabout to meet some of the people who'd been waiting to greet her. Before going on to the Mansion House, official residence of the Lord Mayor of London for lunch and a tribute from the tents of her British Prime Ministers. Yours is and has been a heavy burden, but you discharge it in a way that makes the burdens we carry lighter and our lives brighter and better. We salute you today, we wish you well, and above all, we wish you many happy, long years to reign over us. Ma'am, on behalf of the whole of the country, thank you. And then from a guest who was about to be served a meal which had been chosen in a televised competition, a joke on the theme of, what else, football. Competitive cooking is a new concept to me. <laughs> Although I 
understand there are as yet no penalty shootouts. <laughs> She was on a roll. More humour followed. As Groucho Marx once said, anyone can get old. All you have to do is to live long enough. <laughs> but she said there were other anniversaries more noteworthy than hers. The 50th anniversary of the Duke of Edinburgh's award, the 30th of the Prince's Trust. Husband and eldest son were singled out for praise. But her real gratitude was saved for the end. My Lord Mayor, I cannot do better than to use this wonderful occasion to express my heartfelt appreciation to the many, many thousands of people from this country and from overseas who have sent me letters, cards and messages of goodwill over the last couple of months. This has been truly overwhelming and I would like to thank you all for your kindness. On the day of her coronation, aged 27, she pledged that throughout all of her life she would strive to be worthy of her people's trust. Today, aged 80, her people said thank you. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News. President Bush has announced the creation of a huge American nature sanctuary covering a chain of remote Hawaiian islands, reefs and atolls stretching for nearly 2,000 kilometers. All fishing in the area will be phased out over the next five years. And a quick look at our main story before we go. The first meeting of a newly established international contact group on Somalia has given strong backing to the transitional government there. The government was established with UN support two years ago, but it hasn't been able to enter the capital, Mogadishu. This is BBC World News. I'm Catty Cairn, Washington. I'm Mike Embley in London. Much more on bbcnews.com. BBC World News was brought to you by WLIW New York. Funding for this presentation was provided by the Freeman Foundation of New York, Stowe, Vermont, and Honolulu, the Newman's Own Foundation, and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation.